So today, we're going to talk about the bread and the wine. It's very fitting. We're in the time of unleavened bread. Um, and many people think, well, everyone knows the basics of the bread and the wine. But as always with scripture, there's deeper understanding, deeper insights to be gained. And um, yeah, let's see what some of these are. Let's look, dive in. So the bread and the wine is a key element of the rites associated within our faith. Every faith has rites and customs and rituals and the bread of the wine is possibly the most famous one of like the sort of messianic Yeshua believing faith. There is much symbolism behind the bread and the wine throughout scripture. Um, we've already like, looked at this over the last few weeks. Uh, the most famous of these is the one that our Messiah gave us. Let's look at this. And as they were eating, Yeshua took bread and having blessed, broke and gave it to the taught ones and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, that of the renewed covenant which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now Paul speaks about this in his letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Master that which I also delivered to you, that the Master Yeshua in the night in which he was delivered up took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the master until he comes. Now he goes on to say this, so that whoever should eat this bread or drink this cup of the master unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the master. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For the one who is eating and drinking unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the master. Because of this, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we were to examine ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the master that we should not be condemned with the world. What does it actually mean to eat the bread and drink the cup unworthily? Most people will think, oh, I, I didn't sit here and think hard enough about it. I didn't, you know, get myself into this state of mind and I took it a bit like, does it, is that what it means? Maybe on the surface, on the Peshat level, right on the surface, there is that. But the, as we will see, it goes a lot deeper than this. What does this mean, knowing that the bread is the body and the wine, the blood of Yeshua? So we're going to kind of take some concepts that we might be familiar with and maybe, again like we did yesterday, connect some dots up in ways we hadn't connected them before, hopefully. John 6. Therefore, Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moshe did not give you the bread out of the heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread out of the heaven. For the bread of Elohim is he who comes down out of the heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Master, give us this bread always. And Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not get hungry at all. And he who believes in me shall not get thirsty at all. But I said to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I shall by no means cast out. Because I have come down out of the heaven, not to do my own desire, but the desire of him who sent me. Now, note unbelief being linked to not having the bread of life. It's because it says, you have seen me, the bread of life, but you do not believe. So by implication, you don't have the bread if you don't believe. We'll look at this later on, in a bit later. Now, were the unbelievers, quote unquote, religious people? Those people that Yeshua is saying, I say to you, you have seen me and you don't believe. Were they religious? Yes. He was talking to Israelites. He was talking arguably to Pharisees and lay people. They all had a belief. But he's saying you don't believe, yet you've seen me. Which is interesting, because he's talking to religious people, telling them you're unbelievers. What is the desire of Elohim? 
It's spelled out for us clearly in Deuteronomy 10. And now, Yisrael, what is Yah your Elohim asking of you but to fear Yah your Elohim, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve Yah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being, to guard the commands of Yah and his laws which I command you today for your good. Today is when Moshe was speaking to the Israelites as they're about to go into the land. And you shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart and harden your neck no more. Having a circumcised heart is linked to obedience, to doing verses 12 and 13. Now what does Yeshua, that, that's what Yah says is, is the desire of Elohim, that's his desire for you. What does Yeshua actually say it is? This is the desire of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should not lose of it, but I should raise it in the last day. So that's what the Father wants from Yeshua. And this is the desire of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should possess everlasting life, and I shall raise him up in the last day. Now verse 40 is a favourite of people that say, I put mainstream Christians there because it's all about belief. As I believe factually, I've come to the mental ascent that this fact is true. And they will read it like this. I understand and I've come to this realisation that Yeshua is the Messiah. Therefore, let me in. Where's my golden ticket? Mental assent to the fact that Yeshua is the Messiah does not guarantee you anything. People say um, uh, knowledge is power. It's applied knowledge. That knowledge should make you act in a certain way. This is a very famous passage that we know. My brothers, what use is it for anyone to say he has belief or faith, but does not have works? This belief is unable to save him. And if a brother or sister is naked and in need of daily food, but one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you do, do not give them the bodily needs, what use is it? So also belief, if it does not have works, is in itself dead. But someone might say, you have belief and I have works. Show me your belief without your works and I'll show you my belief by my works. I use the analogy that I believe this water is safe to drink. I believe it's not poisoned. How do I show my belief? I drink from it. You guys all believe those chairs can hold you up. You are demonstrating that belief by sitting on them. You believe that Elohim is one, mental ascent. You do well, the demons also believe, have mental ascent and shudder. So clearly the mental ascent for the demons didn't do them much good. But do you wish to know, foolish man, that the belief without the works is dead? Was not Abraham, our father, declared right to buy works when he offered Yitzhak his son on the altar? Do you see that the belief was working with his works and by the works the belief was perfected? So he's saying you, you need the two together because the works without the belief is just works but the works perfects the belief. And the scripture was filled which says Abraham believed in Elohim and it was reckoned to him for righteousness and he was called Elohim's friend. So James is saying that Elo Abraham didn't just come to a mental ascent. He's saying that was manifested in three dimensional deeds. You see then that a man is declared right by works and not by belief alone. You need the two together. In the same way was not Rahab the whore also declared right by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also the belief is dead without the works. Now it's worth noting that in both instances given by James, belief was not linked actually to keeping Torah, but in trusting Elohim in the face of adversity. Please note that. Abraham was already keeping Torah when his faith was tested. He was already doing that. He was already walking in righteousness. He had the promises. What did Elohim say? Go and slaughter your son. He was already walking in Torah. His belief was tested. It was refined. Is your faith simply head knowledge or is it demonstrated in the real world for all to see? Can people see that that is your belief? Take it further, in the case of Abraham, is your obedience dependent on there being no affliction or tribulation? It's easy to obey when the going is good. 
But when he says, do this, or the Sabbath one is a really easy one to, let's use Sabbath, your boss is putting pressure on you. That's affliction, that's tribulation. How's your obedience going to cope under the pressure then? Um, You know, grandma's saying you've got to come to this, but it's Shabbat. Which one are you going to choose, grandma, or are you going to choose Elohim? By the way, people say, oh, I submit to Yah, I submit to him. Submission is only submission when you don't agree with it. Until then, it's cooperation. I say that to Ruth, (laughs) just as a joke thing. But let's remember that. You're only submitting to Elohim when he wants you to do something that that you're not comfortable with. And you're thinking, hang on a minute. Then it's submission. And by this we know that we know him, if we guard his commands. The one who says, I know him, and does not guard his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It reminds me of Isaiah. Uh, he says, to the Torah and to the prophets, if they do not have these, the, truth is, the light is not in them, he says. They have no light. But whoever guards his word... Truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So you know how James was saying that the belief was perfected by the works? Elohim's love is perfected by your obedience. You know, let's use a husband and wife analogy. It's obvious when two people love each other because of the things they do for each other. You, you go above and beyond. You're a lot more willing to sacrifice and to meet in the middle with someone you love. The one who says he stays in him ought also himself also to walk even as he walked. This is what you should, when you should was saying, come follow me. He was saying, be like me, follow in my footsteps. Therefore, when Yeshua said that it's the desire of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should possess everlasting life, He was actually being in perfect congruence with what the Father's will was, which was, what is Yahya Elohim asking of you but to fear Yahya Elohim, to walk in all his ways and to love him. Your love is demonstrated by your obedience to him. To serve Yahya Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, to guard the commands of Yah and his laws which I command you today for your good. Can people see how Yeshua was just simply saying the same thing worded differently? Belief, true belief. Yeshua said, but I said to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. This makes more sense now. Once, now we've gone through this. To see Messiah as he is and to partake of him and to not believe in him is one way of eating the bread unworthily. Do you see where I'm, go- where I'm going? All of this is in context of eating the bread and drinking the cup unworthily. So to know what he's truly like... And to shun that and to say, well, actually, I'm going to keep taking of him, though it's, you're eating of it unwear, unworthily. This manifests itself in many different ways. That was for them back then. We're the modern age now. See how that's working for us. So why families are being torn apart. And uh, He knows my heart. Yes, he does. It's truly wicked. It's deceitful above all things. So he does know your heart. That's not a good thing. Relationship is more important than works. Oh boy, that's a corker. I've, I've heard this uh, f- from close ones as well. We've just read in John that he who claims to know him and does not, uh, does not obey, doesn't know him, he's a liar. So much for relationship is more important than works. I mean, again, let, let's use the analogy of a man and a wife. I, I can say till I'm blue in the face, Ruth, I love you, but I'm not doing the deeds of love that manifest you. What does it mean? It's empty words. Twisting and rationalizing. So people will rationalize their twisting of scripture. What you're doing is actually rationalizing. I've took that from someone else and I like it, but it's very true. We rationalize to ourselves that I will actually, it's okay, you know, you know, I can twist it and turn it there and it's all good. He'll be fine with it. It actually makes us hypocrites. Remember, unleavened bread, the, the leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy, it, all these are part of the theme of unleavened bread. So let's go back to John 6. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, now we know what he means by believing in him, possesses everlasting life. It's interesting that in Torah it says, if you keep these commands, you will have life abundantly for all generations, which is interesting, all generations. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of the heavens so that anyone might eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down out of the heaven and if anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And indeed, the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. The Yehudim, the Jews, therefore, were striving with one another, saying, how is this one able to give us flesh to eat? They're just not getting it. They're thinking in the earthly, fleshly, while he's speaking spiritually. They're not discerning the matters of the spirit. Yeshua therefore said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of Adam, the son of man, and drink his blood, you possess no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood possesses everlasting life and I shall raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is truly food and my blood is truly drink. I know we've covered this before but I'm going to add another angle to it. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood stays in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of the heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and died. He who eats this bread shall live forever. So the written word, so now scripture, the written word is likened unto bread. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, You shall remember that Yah your Elohim led you all the way, these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble you. This is what's happening to us now. We're in the wilderness of our lives to be humbled, to be proven. Do you love Yah your Elohim? Whether, what, what is in your heart, whether you guard his commands or not, to see if you're genuine. If, and he humbled you and he let you suffer hunger, tribulation, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, to make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yah. Now we know that Yeshua is the word made flesh. John 1 verse 14, and the word came and dwelt amongst us and was manifest in flesh. When Yeshua said, this is the bread which comes down out of the heaven, so that anyone might eat of it and not die, I am the living bread. He was simply restating what the Torah says, that those who eat the bread or the word of life shall live. We'll keep taking this. He, he was, if he's the word made flesh, you are partaking of the word. Of, and he demonstrated how this was to be lived out in your life without hypocrisy. He was the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He drives this point even further. Later on in John 6, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh does not profit at all. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. We know that Yeshua said the Spirit will convict you of sin and it will remind you of everything that I have taught you. His words, our Spirit and our life. So if you are to partake of Him, of His Word, of His Spirit, of His nature. As an aside, isn't it part of the renewed covenant, you know, that the Spirit writes the Torah or the bread of life on our hearts? It all ties together. Yeshua said that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood. Yeshua also said that the cup of wine was the blood of the renewed covenant. We read that at the beginning. Let's look at how wine was thought of in Yeshua's day. This is a quote from Pirkei Avot 420. It's a Jewish rabbinical writing from between 200 BC to 200 AD. This is pre-Talmudic time. Rabbi Yosei ben Yehuda said, He who learns from the young, unto what can he be compared? He can be compared to one who eats unripe grapes and drinks unfermented wine from his vat. But he who learns from the old, unto what can he be compared? He can be compared to one who eats ripe grapes and drinks old wine. Rabbi Meir said, Do not pay attention to the container, but pay attention to that which is in it. There is a new container, so a young person, full of old wine, 
And here is a contain, an old container which doesn't even contain any new wine. You see a lot of that nowadays. Old containers with pure tosh coming out of them. This should actually help us understand what Yeshua said in the parable of the wineskins. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine shall burst the wineskins and run out, and the wineskins shall be ruined. But the new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. And no, this is the key. No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new wine, for he says the old is better. Mainstream teaching will tell you, you need to be a new wineskin with new wine. You need to be a new wineskin with old wine. The old is better. Where, let's remember, what was Yeshua? A Jew. He would have known Jewish teaching. It's actually, Pip sent me a wonderful article actually, that a lot of what Yeshua says can be found in rabbinical writing. I'm not saying that that's where he got it from or... There were, it's Jewish thought. I just found it very interesting. And who would have thought that he would be quoting from things of the day, using analogies that these people can understand. But let's look at this thing of the old is better. It's all over scripture. If the wine is teaching, what was the teaching that Yeshua was bringing? Was it new wine or was it old wine? Did Yeshua bring something new? John 7, 16, Yeshua answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. To me, that's as old as it gets. The Ancient of Days. Because I spoke not for myself, but the Father who has sent me has given me a command that I should say what I should speak. What was the very first thing Yeshua said when he came out of um, the desert? The very first thing. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The age of, that's what all the prophets were saying, repent. And I know that this, his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, as the Father has said to me, so I speak. In Jeremiah 6, verse said, yeah, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, the old wine, where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for yourselves. But they said, we do not walk in it. Let's look at finding rest. What did Yeshua say? Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I shall give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn. What Partake of the bread, of the words, his words and spirit, our life. For I am meek and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your beings. What did Yeshua say about the Pharisees? You, You pile up heavy burdens on the people, and you don't even budge a finger to help them. And he was saying, don't listen to the doctrines of men, just stand in the old paths. For my yoke is gentle and my burden is light. But my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to what is false. They have stumbled from their ways, from the ancient paths, to walk in bypaths and not on a highway. How about the new paths or the new wine, that of men? You're stumbling off the path you're meant to be on and like, oh, look at this new shiny thing. Let's look at the highway. What highway is the Father speaking of? In Isaiah 35, 8 says, There shall be a highway and a way, and it shall be called the way of set apartness, the way of holiness. The unclean does not pass over it, but it is for those who walk the way and no fools wander on it. No lion is there, nor any ravenous beast go up on it. It is not found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of Yah shall return and enter Sion with singing, with everlasting joy in their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The redeemed shall walk there. How were we redeemed? We covered this yesterday. Therefore... What did we do yesterday? Passover. And we mentioned yesterday in the teaching on blood that the blood, you, it doesn't just apply to everyone. You can't just claim it like a magical incantation and hope for the best. You had to be Israel. You had to be in covenant. And the blood on the doorpost and so forth. And what were they told to do when eating of the Passover? Gird up your loins. Peter, therefore, having girded up the loins of your mind... 
being sober, set your expectation perfectly upon the favour that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts in your ignorance, instead, as the one who called you is set apart, so also you should become set apart in all behaviour, because it has been written, be set apart, for I am set apart. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, past the time of your sojourning in fear, knowing that you were redeemed, you're redeemed with blood from your futile way of life, inherited from your Father. Do you know what futile means? You, no matter how much you do it, it's pointless. It avails to nothing. From your fathers, not with what is corruptible, silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Messiah, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. Who was redeemed by the blood in the Passover? The firstborn. And they had to be redeemed back from Yah. Note the links to Passover, girding up your loins, being redeemed by blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless. Passover is written all over this passage. Foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but manifested in these last times for your sakes, who through him believe in Elohim. We've just covered what belief is. Who raised him from the dead and gave him esteem so that your belief, your faith and hope and expectation are in Elohim. Now that you have cleansed your lives in obeying the truth. Truth is something to be obeyed, not to come to an assent to. Through the Spirit. What, what is the Spirit? Yeshua said, my words are spirit and are life. To unfeigned brotherly love, love one another fervently with a clean heart. What does Yeshua say? That those who are clean in heart will see the kingdom in the Beatitudes? This is how you get a clean heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the living word of Elohim, which remains forever. You've put to death that old man, that nature, and been reborn. What is interesting is that Yeshua told us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is to partake of the bread and the wine. I know, really obvious. This is to have the word and the teaching of it. We said that the word was the bread of life. Wine is re reckoned to teaching. You, you can't have just the word and no one teaching you it. So, so it needs to be expounded. So why are you people sitting here listening to me? Hopefully you're learning something. Hopefully you're seeing things in a new way. You need to have the word and the teaching of it. This is also to have the Torah and the blood of Messiah. To have the blood of Messiah without obedience is to profane that blood. To have the Torah without the blood of Messiah, well, now you're trying to justify yourself by works, by your own things. You cannot have one without the other. So now we've gone through all of this, so that whoever should eat this bread or drink the cup of the master unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the master. So now we're starting to get a deeper understanding, I hope, of what that means. Let's actually unpack this now, now that we've laid like a foundation. Paul says this literally in the previous chapter. So he says this, let's go to Corinthians 10. Therefore, my beloved ones, flee from idolatry. The context of this chapter is how he's saying how the Israelites came into the wilderness and loads of them fell in the wilderness and they didn't make it, and they're to be examples unto us. That's the context of this bit. Therefore, my beloved ones, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, the cup of Messiah, is it not a sharing in the blood of Messiah? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Messiah? Because there is one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at Yisrael after the flesh. So he's going to say, look at Israel in the shadow picture, on the earth right now. Are, those, are not those who eat of the offerings sharer in the altar? He's talking about the priests who eat the offerings. They share of the altar, of that holiness. 
What then do I say? That an idol is of any value or that which is offered to idols is of any value? No, but what the Gentiles offer, they offer to demons and not to Elohim. And this is the point. I do not wish you to become sharers with demons. We're drinking of the cup of Messiah, yet other people, he's wanting you to not share something else. You are not able to drink the cup of the master and the cup of demons. You are not able to partake of the table of the master and of the table of demons. If you're partaking of the table of demons, and you're trying to you're a hypocrite by trying to take partake of the table of the master. Luke in Luke he says this, you sure it does. No servant is able to serve two masters. For he either he shall hate the one and love the other, or else he shall cling to the one and despise the other. You are not able to serve Elohim and Mammon. Mammon was a personification of wealth, of worldly possessions. You cannot serve me, essentially, because that's what you're doing with worldly possessions, serving yourself, or serve Elohim. It's one or the other. Either you serve one master or you serve the other. There's no grey area. Either you walk in the flesh or you walk in the spirit. We covered this in the blood teaching. You can't do both. The flesh and the spirit are enmity with each other. Either you serve unrighteousness or serve righteousness. Paul goes on about this in Romans 7. You've been... You were slaves to unrighteousness. You've been redeemed, freed from that, now serve righteousness. Either you're stiff-necked or you have a circumcised heart. Either you serve self or you serve him above. Either you walk with integrity or you're a hypocrite. Either you are a whitewashed tomb or you are the living temple of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Either you know him or you think you do. I purposely worded that way. Either you know him or you think you do. Either you're his or you're not. Remember, the seal of the living Elohim. The Greek has this idea of being genuine. We must remember that what we practice and what we do, sorry for the typo, is equated to who we join ourselves to. Let's see how this plays out in Numbers 25. In Israel dwelt in Shittim, and the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. And they invited the people to the slaughterings of their mighty ones, and the people ate and bowed down to their mighty ones. Thus Israel was joined to Baal Peor, and the displeasure of Yah burnt against Israel. This is talking of uh, marriage, physical language. It's talking of spiritual adultery, basically. That's what it means to be joined. When a man and a wife come together, they are joined and become one flesh. Yisrael was supposed to be joined to Yah. They went and joined themselves onto someone else or something else. And Paul just said that the pagans offer up to demons. So have a guess what they joined themselves to. Paul says in Corinthians... Do you not know that your bodies are members of Messiah? You you are the body of Messiah. Shall I then take the members of Messiah and make them members of a whore? Let it not be. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a whore is one body? For he says the two shall become one flesh. This is why Yah takes it very personally when you're in spiritual adultery. Either you're one with him or you go off in someone else. I've mentioned, what's the type and shadow in the Old Testament? When someone profane or unclean came, they were struck down dead to preserve the holiness of Yah. He's only going to do that. And he who is joined to the master is one spirit. Flee whoring. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body, but he who commits whoring sins against his own body. You're, You're literally profaning the very body he's given you. Or do you not know that your body is the dwelling place of the set-apart spirit who is in you, which you have from Elohim, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. You were redeemed. 
We think of redeeming as, yeah, the blood was poured and brilliant. When you redeem something, you give something in exchange for it. There was an exchange going on. There was a cost. Therefore, esteem Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are of Elohim. Because you can do all the physical stuff, but you can still be in a state of spiritual adultery. Either with another idol or king me. Do you not know that you are a dwelling place, a temple of Elohim, and that the spirit of Elohim dwells in you? If any, listen, if anyone destroys the dwelling place of Elohim, Elohim shall destroy him. For the dwelling place of Elohim is set apart, which you are. That includes you. If you try and destroy your own body, this is, maybe this is why you get curses. I was reading a verse. I should have included it. I didn't think to, but it says that it's in Hosea somewhere. Because Elohim knows us, he disciplines us. We're more likely to be disciplined than someone who's not in covenant. Why? Because we claim his name. This goes along with what Hebrews says, that Yah disciplines those, those whom he loves. If you're not being disciplined, you're an illeg illegitimate son. Discipline is a good thing. It shows that he cares. It shows that he's giving you a chance. Next time you want to get into self-condemnation, the fact that you're being disciplined is a good thing. It shows he's got his eye on you. He's giving you that chance to be refined. So we've covered of eating the bread, drinking the cup. Let's look at it being unworthily. Let's look at being worthy or unworthy. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Harsh words from our Messiah. And he who does not take up his stake, his cross, and follow after me is not worthy of me. What Paul, Paul says that we're to crucify the old man, crucify the flesh. If you're not willing to do that on a daily basis, you are not worthy. And Yah answered, again, this is not stumbling. There's a difference between stumbling and willful rebellion. We'll have to do a teaching on that maybe. And Yeshua answering said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy of attaining that age. That's the bit I want to focus on, never mind the rest. You have to be counted worthy to attain that age. That means you might have had to do something maybe. So you also, when you see, so this is when Yeshua is talking, you know, the disciples ask him, what are the signs of your coming? And he gives them all the signs of the end times. And in Luke 21, Matthew 20, I forgot which one. Know that the reign of Elohim is near. Truly, truly, I say to you, this generation shall by no means pass away till all shall have taken place. The heaven and the earth shall pass away, but my words shall by no means pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down by gluttony and drunkenness and worries of this life, and that day come on you suddenly. Are you paying attention to minding the matters of the flesh or the matters of the spirit? For it shall come as a snare on all those dwelling on the face of all the earth. Watch then at all times and pray that you be counted worthy to escape all this about to take place, to stand before the son of Adam. In Luke 10, I love this. Stay, this is when he's commissioning his disciples. Uh, you know, he sends them out in pairs, two by two, to go and minister the, the news of the kingdom. And he says this to them. Stay in the same house, eating and drinking whatever with them, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not move from house to house. Just as a labourer is worthy of his wages, so are the righteous worthy of eternal life. Paul says very clearly, the unrighteous do not make it into the kingdom. Being righteous makes you counted worthy. This puts a spanner in a lot of people's theology. I call upon you, therefore, I, the prisoner of the master, to walk worthily of the calling with which you are called. You walk in in a worthy fashion. Remember, we are, we're supposed to be emissaries of the kingdom. This is why I say to people, before they start wearing zitzits, remember, people are watching you. Walk worthily once you wear them, because people will watch you. 
They won't talk about them. They're embarrassed to ask, but they're watching you. Walk worthily of the calling with which you were called, with all humility and meekness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being eager to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In Philippians, again, he says this. Paul says this a lot. Behave yourselves worthily of the good news of Messiah. You have to behave in a certain way. People are watching. You bear a name. You are not your own. In order that whether I come and see you or am absent, I hear about you that you stand fast in one spirit, with one being striving together for the belief of the good news. There's this idea of actually being unified and walking worthily and being unified. There's unity included in that. In Revelation 3, remember then how you have received and heard and watch and repent. If then you do not wake up, I shall... Look, watch and repent is linked to waking up. Interesting. And I shall come upon you as a thief and you shall not know at all what hour I come upon you. Nevertheless... You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. They were found worthy. They did something to be found worthy. It wasn't just this blanket, boom, that's it, magic hands, you're all good now. To he who overcomes shall be dressed in white robe. He's just told you to be dressed in white, you have to be worthy and you have to overcome overcome, shall be dressed in white and shall by no means blot out his name from the book of life, but I shall confess his name before my father and before his messengers. So that, now we've got verse 27 kind of down. Let's move forward. Whoever should, so we kind of understand of what, being worthy, doing things in a worthy fashion. Because if not, you're guilty of the body and the blood of the master, which, which implies that you're guilty of crucifying him by the way. That's what he's hinting at. You're guilty of his blood. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. What time of festal year is the bread and the wine associated with? Passover, unleavened bread, the time we're in now. Why should we be examining ourselves at this time of year? Removing the leaven. Remove the leaven. Paul is literally talking to a group of people that's about to enter into an unleavened bread. We know this because of what he says earlier in the letter. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the entire lump? Therefore cleanse out the old leaven so that you are a new lump, as you are unleavened. So for also Messiah our Passover was offered to us. So then let us observe the festival not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, the opposite of being a hypocrite, and truth. I believe Paul was writing to them as they were entering unleavened bread. And when you read the whole letter, you can actually see the themes all the way throughout. He's talking about hypocrisy, about not being joined to something, about clearing out all the old. It's amazing. So... He's examining, we've covered being examined. You have, this is why we, I was saying in the weeks leading up to this, start looking in. Start asking how to reveal stuff to you. For the one who is eating and drinking unworthily, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the master. Because of this, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. If you've not examined, hang on, what's... If you've not examined yourself, that means you've not, took, you've not looked at what's actually inside of you. You're going in on the assumption that you're okay when you're not. Let's look at being sick. In Deuteronomy, this is a curse for, for disobedience. If you do not guard to do all the words of this Torah that are written in this book, to fear this esteemed and awesome name, Yah your Elohim, then Yah shall bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and lasting plagues, and grievous and lasting sicknesses. And he shall bring back on you all the diseases of Mitzrayim, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this Torah, Yah does bring upon you until you are destroyed. I find it 
ironic, inverted commas, that the more sin abounds, the more all these crazy diseases. I mean, like, diseases that have never... You, you don't hear of them. And they just, like, everyone's got something new nowadays. And it's getting more and more common. Many sleep because of this, of not examining yourself, of drinking the, bread, uh, drinking the wine and eating the bread unworthily. Many sleep. What does it mean to sleep? So to be joined to something else, we've just covered being joined. You know, you cannot partake of the cup of Yah and the cup of demons. To be joined to something else and then claim to be his by partaking of the bread and wine is hypocrisy. Paul said, when you do this, you proclaim his death. You are, if you eat of the same bread, you are claiming to be part of that body. But if you're joined to something else, well, you're a hypocrite, you're an adulterer. Not examining oneself leading up to the feast and not ridding oneself of leaven and hypocrisy leads to judgment. To not exact, why? Because to not examine oneself leads to one not confessing their sin or to hiding it away. Sometimes, you know, you, you kind of know it's there, but I'll, I'll do it after the feast. Because of this, many sleep. Because of not examining, not being worthy. What does this actually mean, to, to the sleep? Pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For Yah has poured out the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your heads, the seers. And the entire vision is to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men give to one who knows books, saying, Read this, please. And he said, I am unable, for it is sealed. And the book is given to one who does not know books, saying, Read this, please. And he said, I have not known books. And Yah says, Because this people has drawn near with its mouth, and with its lips they have esteemed me. So these are religious people claiming the name, and it has kept its heart far from me, and their fear of me has become the command of men that is taught. This is what Yeshua quoted when the Pharisees were saying, Why don't your disciples follow the traditions of the elders? Hypocrisy. Therefore, see, I am again doing a marvellous work among this people, a marvellous work in wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their clever men shall be hidden. I would argue this is why a lot of quote-unquote believers, you can tell them all you want, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, what you're doing is wrong. They've got the spirit of deep sleep. They claim him with their mouth, but they don't walk as he expects us to walk. Do we actually believe him at his word? Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from Yah, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? Hiding your sin away. It's okay. I'll just, you know, keep my sin in the back. No one will see. It's hypocrisy. This is why we need to confess. Confess. Because... Let's face it, we all sin. We all, we, we, you know, I'm a sinner. I've got my hand up. It's okay. Well, it's not, but you need to confess it. You need to confess because if not, you're hiding your sin. In Corinthians 11, for if we were to examine ourselves, we would not be judged. Remember, oh, I've lost my train of thought, sorry. We would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the master that we should not be condemned with the world. The reason we are disciplined is to wake us up. So if we do enter in the feast a bit willy-nilly, expect some judgment, but it's to wake you up. That Then you can actually see the stuff in your life that offends him. He's given you that opportunity to come clean. This gives us the opportunity to repent. Repentance leads to life. In Ezekiel 18, therefore I judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the master Yah. Repent and turn back from all your transgressions and let not crookedness be a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all the transgressions by which you have transgressed and make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Yisrael? 
This is interesting because in the New Covenant Scriptures, it says that the Spirit will give, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And here he's saying, make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. How do you think he gives you a new heart? He puts you through the ringer. He says he will chastise his people. This is a two-way process. You draw near to Elohim and he will draw near to you. Make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit and he will, the spirit will do the rest. Meet him halfway. For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, declares the Master Yah. So turn back and live. Turn back. Teshuvah. Repent. Repentance leads to life. Turn back and live. That's the, this is the whole point of unleavened bread. Turn back and live. He's given you an opportunity. Thank him for exposing that hypocrisy in all our lives. Because it gives us the chance to turn back and live. <laughs>